Specialty Care Scientific Advancements, uh, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, I am joined uh, by Dr. Steve Frank, uh, the Associate Professor of Entomology at North Carolina State University, uh, and by Patrick Anderson, uh, arborologist with uh, Rainbow. Uh, now, before we get started, uh, just a couple of quick uh, housekeeping items. Uh, in order to get your ISA CU for this webinar, uh, you'll need to enter in your ISA certification number into the questions and chat box right now, uh, and uh, we'll make sure that you get your CEU for attending this webinar. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, feel free to also type those into the same uh, box, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can uh, at the end of the uh, presentation with uh, whatever time we have uh, left available. Uh, also, uh, I would like to make a quick plug for Saluting Branches. Uh, it's an important event and day of service that is hosted all across the country uh, where green industry professionals give back to veteran cemeteries by performing tree and landscape work. Uh, last year, we had over 1,400 people uh, volunteer, uh, and we donated more than $1.4 million in services. Uh, this year, Saluting Branches will be on September 20th, uh, 2017. Uh, if you would like more information on how you can get involved, uh, please go to salutingbranches.org. Uh, that's the uh, website I've got opened up here. Um, all right. Uh, now to start off the webinar on Armored Sales Management, uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, welcome Dr. Frank. Hello, folks. Um, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Patrick, for inviting me. Um, I hope... Uh-oh, let's see, something came up on my screen. Well, we'll just get rid of that. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about my favorite insects, scale insects, probably your guys' least favorite insects. Um, but we'll get started on this. Uh-oh. And uh, Dr. Frank, you, uh, I just sent you the uh, screen share button. That's, oh, okay. Uh, that's up there. Yep. So what do I, do I click it? Yes. Just Show my screen. Click. Okay. Yep. Perfect. There All right. We go. So everybody's up and running now. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. IPM for scale insects on urban trees. Um, there we go. I think the first thing that's important about this topic to cover is being able to tell the difference between armored scales and soft scales. Even though, there, well, there's, there's lots of different families of scales. These are the two most common. And even though they're all tiny and waxy and a real pain for you, they're actually physiologically very different. And so the reason that this becomes important is in management, um, where certain products will kill soft scales but not armored scales. And so uh, you can waste a lot of time and money and make clients pretty upset if you're using the wrong products on the wrong kinds of scales. So we'll just go through this real quick so that you've got at least some idea how to tell the difference. Um, the, two, the two main features that that distinguish these uh, kind of to the naked eye is that armored scales have, uh, and can you guys see my pointer if I use that to point? Okay, well I'll keep doing it in case. Um, armored scales have a waxy cover, that's called a test, and if you if, you, if you're looking at a scale on a tree and you flip that test over with your fingernail or uh, the point of your pocket knife or something, you can see that, as in this picture, the, the insect stays attached to the tree and the waxy cover comes off of the insect. With soft scales, the way that they produce their test is that they... Um, extrude the waxy material directly from their body and so it's permanently attached. And so if you try and flip over a soft scale, you're going to get the whole insect that flips over, not just the waxy cover. Um, and so that's one way to examine these and, and try and figure it out. The other way, and part of what makes them 
so different physiologically is is that armored scales do not produce honeydew and I'm sure you're all aware honeydew is the shiny sticky juice that um, aphids and white flies and mealybugs and soft scales excrete that you know gets on people's cars and decks and, and makes them mad and the reason that they excrete that is because they feed in the plant phloem which is full of sugar armored scales don't feed in the phloem and so they don't produce honeydew so if you've got a scale infestation and the leaves and the branches and the the sidewalk have honeydew and sooty mold um, then you have soft scales on that on that tree that's not to say you don't also have some armored scales on there but you definitely have some soft scales if you've got a scale infestation and no honeydew at all you've um, got armored scales in that case okay and so what we're going to focus on today is armored scales and some of the common ones and we'll start with a general life cycle we'll talk about some of the species uh, in particular but the general life cycle here is here's the the cover of a gloomy scale the eggs are typically laid beneath that test um, and beneath the, the, the female a after those eggs hatch which usually just takes a few days or a couple weeks then the first stage is called a crawler and those crawlers they do just that they crawl and it's typically the only mobile stage of the life cycle and so the eggs hatch the crawlers crawl out to look for a new spot to feed um, and once they start feeding they settle down um, and start building a cover of their own okay crawlers molt uh, you know one or more times and start producing that waxy cover and um, you know depending on and we'll talk about the generation time of some of these insects depending on the generation time um, at some point of course they they become adults and typically the the adult females stay looking like scale insects as these blobs on the branch and the males often have wings and will um, you know they can fly and find new females to mate with and so that's the the general life cycle the reason that the life cycle is important is because armored scales have one particularly vulnerable stage and that's the crawlers and so if we go back a second these tiny crawlers all these yellow dots on this uh, euonymus leaf these little tiny guys up in that gloomy scale and down here on this this pine needle scale um, they they're very tiny which makes them vulnerable and they don't have a, a waxy cover which makes them vulnerable so figuring out the life cycle of different scales is important because you want to identify when those crawlers are active to best time your management practices okay so that's the the general life cycle I'm going to go through just four scales there's thousands of species of scales um, and of course nobody's ever going to know all of them on site and you don't really need to necessarily um, you know that's what we have books for and that's what we have have you know diagnostic people in the clinics for as long as you can tell if you've got an armored scale or not and you can distinguish some of these most common species uh, you'll be in good shape but these these are probably uh, among the most common and will give you an idea of uh, the biology of, of scale insects generally armored scale insects so here we go gloomy scale my favorite obscure scale pine needle scale and Japanese maple scale okay gloomy scale is a scale that 
my lab works on quite a bit. It just happens that the last person ever to work on this was also at North Carolina State University in 1912. Um, and here's a close-up of the gloomy scale. And Dr. Metcalf worked on this 100 years ago. And at that point, he called it gloomy scale, the most important insect enemy of shade trees in North Carolina. So you would have thought people would have followed up on it a little more before uh, 100 years. But here we are. We're picking it up. So here's a, a typical branch infested uh, with gloomy scales. This is a red maple twig. And you can see all the tiny hemispherical bumps on that twig. And those are the gloomy scales. And of course, I mean, just from that picture, you can tell they become quite dense. And you've probably seen this before. The general biology of this critter, um, they overwinter as uh, females. And they begin laying eggs in spring. The crawlers for this insect tend to appear in early summer through midsummer, and uh, you know a lot. I'll just tell you ahead of time. Specific dates, of course, are going to change by year, and whether it's a warm year, a cool year, and and also, of course, by your location. And so, um, you know, things will become active later in Massachusetts than they will in North Carolina. So, uh, I'll try. I try and and think in terms of seasons rather than specific dates just to make it more applicable. But early summer is when we see the crawlers for these guys, and there's just one generation a year. Part of the trick, you know, we talked about the crawlers that are the most vulnerable, and you want to try and target the crawlers, especially if you're using something like horticultural oil. And for some scale insects, like Euonymus scale, all those crawlers come out almost simultaneously on a particular plant. And so at that point, it's very easy to, to knock out a big chunk of that generation with one application of, say, horticultural oil. With these gloomy scales, the crawlers come out gradually over about eight weeks. And so Anytime you make an application like that, you're really only uh, you're really only getting a small proportion of the crawlers that will eventually emerge. So that's one of the reasons that this scale is difficult to manage. So gloomy scale hosts, the most common of all gloomy scale hosts, and among the most common trees planted in the U.S. is red maples. Um, here's one, you know, this is on our campus, heavily infested with gloomy scales. You can see all the bumps on the trunk of that tree. And, uh, and so this is by far the primary host. It, it can get on, on other Hosts, we've seen it on hickories and, and dogwoods, and uh, I've got some tulip poplars on campus I've found that, that have some. So it, it is generalist, uh, but it seems to be most aggressive and most common on red maples and other maples. And here's the damage. And I didn't include damage slides for every single scale insect because it's, it's generally very similar. And so you can see on this slide, these two trees on campus, um, not exactly beautiful specimens, where this tree on the left is misshapen. You, there's a lot of dead. Um, the tips of the twigs are dead up in here. The, the canopy is very thin. The tree to the right, of course, you can see that building right through the canopy where it should be dense and lush. More uh, die back up here on the tips. And these are the kinds of things where if you get high densities of scales that are pulling 
um, energy and resources out of the plant, you're going to have, you know, gradually, uh, you know, thin twigs that start to die back, and then as densities become greater, you'll lose uh, more of the more of the canopy, and the canopy will become sparser. This can take a long time, though, and oftentimes by the time people realize that there's scale insects there, the infestation has, has gotten out of control pretty badly. Okay, obscure scale. This is another super cool scale. It's related to gloomy scale. Actually, they're in the same genus. And so the difference here is partly their hosts, the most common hosts differ. These obscure scales are flatter and wider. The gloomy scales are um, very hemispherical, and these tend to be, well, like I say, flatter and wider, not so round. Um, here's here's a twig with with some obscure scales on there, a little bit different look than the gloomy scales. Biology of these critters, also one generation per year. These overwinter as nymphs, and as spring comes on, those nymphs quickly mature into adults. And so, um, you know, you really, by late spring, have adults under there. And uh, the crawlers for these also come out over a very long period of time. And so, you know, that's this is another one that's difficult to manage for that reason. You don't have a simultaneous flush of crawlers. Hosts of this of this this guy, uh, oaks are the primary host, and so you can probably walk to almost any pin oak that that is handy or red oak and cut a twig off of that and find these, you know. Um, and, and you should do that after the webinar, just walk out of your office or wherever you are and there's probably a pin oak out there and you can probably just take a quick look at these guys. Um, but these two are generalists and so we find obscure scale on other plants like dogwoods, hickories, we find it on red maples and other maples, willows, and and some other tree species. But again, where it seems to be uh, most common and most aggressive is on oaks. Pine needle scale. Obviously, pine trees of uh, not just pines. We'll get to the hosts, other conifers, too. Uh, this one is, uh, you know, it's it's pretty distinct. You can tell from this bottom picture, if you've got a bunch of these on there, even if you just have a few, you can see those white flecks of the scale against uh, the background of the needles. And I was opening up some of these just the other day in Raleigh and we had adults and eggs underneath there. These are, they make purple eggs, which is cool. Here's some in the bottom picture. Once you, you, you pick those covers off, you can see the eggs. And this is an important monitoring tactic. You know, if you want to find out when the crawlers are active, it's even better if you can, if you can monitor these scales by flipping the covers over and if you find eggs then you know you've got a week or two at least before the crawlers come out and so that gives you time to actually plan if you're just monitoring for crawlers then uh, you know some people will monitor for crawlers by putting double-sided tape around a twig or something like that and and look for the crawlers to get stuck on there once you find crawlers it's go time uh, if you monitor for eggs, then, you know, you can, you've got a little more time to plan. 
So flip those covers over and just take a look at what's going on under there. These uh, overwinter as eggs and adults. Um, and there's one to two generations per year. In the far north, even uh, you know, above Pennsylvania, New England area, there's one generation per year. Anywhere south of that, it seems like there's at least two. And people haven't looked at it very thoroughly in southern states, so who knows, there could be even more. Um, but uh, one to two generations per year with this guy. Late spring, the crawlers become active. Like I say, uh, two weeks ago, I think I, I did a blog post about these and there were eggs under there. I haven't checked to see if the crawlers are out yet. Um, and then midsummer, you're going to get in most areas another batch. You know, it'll take it'll take two months for the crawl the spring crawlers to mature, and then come June or July, depending on where you live, you'll have more eggs and more crawlers for that second generation. Okay, pine needle hosts. Of course, pines, you know, whatever your most abundant local pines are, it probably has it here, primarily loblolly pines and, and white pines. Um, but of course, as you know, as you as you go around, there's lots of lots of pines and other conifers, firs and spruces and cedars are also susceptible to these scales. And they also have their own batch of scales to deal with. But um, you know, this is this is a pretty common one on conifers. Japanese maple scale. This one is a sort of increasing problem. It seems like um, it's it's obviously an exotic from Japan. I think it came in on pear trees many many years ago. Um, and nurseries are having a terrible time with this insect. Here's a branch. This is, uh, you know, I took this picture walking to work. It's on a dogwood tree. And one thing that's important to note about this that I try and get through to the nursery folks is it's called Japanese maple scale, but that doesn't mean it's always on Japanese maples. It is Japanese. It gets on maples. Uh, but it's not just on Japanese maples. And in fact, there's lots of hosts that it's far more common on than Japanese maples, like dogwood. We see this uh, all over on, on dogwood street trees. And so and you can see how dense all these white flecks are the scales. OK, here's Japanese maple scale on a maple. Again, the white flecks. There's also, uh, you know, if you were looking at this in person, you would see some brown covers. And that's just because they have this dusty white uh, material that if you rub that off, they're actually brown underneath. OK, biology. Again, New England being the way far north, they report one generation per year of this critter. And and that may well be. I think it probably also varies depending on, you know, if you're if you're in the heart of a city where it's warmer more of the year, you might get more generations. Mid-Atlantic, Maryland and Virginia regions report two generations a year. Folks haven't really done the research further south than that, uh, but it's likely that there's two and a half or three generations per year in other areas. And they overwinter as immature and then mature quickly once spring comes into adults and lay eggs. Underneath, they produce these really beautiful purple eggs that are lined up in this bottom picture. 
the this is another one and I think you know I've tried to pick the most common scales for for this talk and I think part of the reason that these are the most common and the most severe is because they all have this extended period of crawler hatch and so crawlers from Japanese maple scales can trickle out for eight weeks which means that really at any given time you've got overlapping generations and you might have eggs, crawlers, nymphs, and adults all at the same time, which makes them incredibly hard to manage. This one is most general of all in terms of host plants and uh, you know over 45 genera from 27 families Here's some of the common ones, this whole list. Of course, maples and uh, dogwoods we've talked about, Catonia aster. Lots of, in the nursery industry, they seem to have most trouble with this on broadleaf evergreens like hollies and, uh, you know, little leaf hollies and boxwoods and, and, and things like that. Um, but, the other tree I see it on a lot around here is elms. The city's been planting lots of these new elms in the last three years, and when I walk around, it seems like they're all getting covered in Japanese maple scales. So keep an eye out for that. I'll be curious to know how common that is. Okay, and and you know we've gone through four of thousands of scales there's lots of other important armored scales there's a whole book that's really fantastic that I keep on my desk here armored scales of trees and shrubs um, that you know if you want more detail about a particular critter that's the the place to go um, but again if you can at least detect these common ones and if you can at least tell whether you have an armored scale or not that's a big step in terms of, of management and then use your you know your regional extension clinics to help with identifications oftentimes you know our clinic here at NC State will identify from photographs if they can and they don't charge for that and so you know, sometimes you can get a decent picture and, and get a pretty quick identification. Okay, I'm going to go through just a brief management section here. I think uh, Patrick's going to talk more about this, but the main thing that I mentioned is that the timing of control is critical with scales, and especially if you're trying to use some sort of product with contact activity. You know, these critters live underneath of a waterproof cover, and so you're not going to contact the insect when it's an adult or even a nymph. And so something like a pyrethroid, if you spray it on an adult, it's just not going to kill it. And what it does is kill all the natural enemies and um, you end up with with more scales after, over time because the natural enemies are being killed but the scales are not. Okay, horticultural oil and uh, some of the newer emulsified oils uh, like the stuff oil um, can be used on scale insects. Again, this is when the timing is important to try and, and target those, those crawlers. Also dormant oil applications uh, may help a little. Oils don't leave a toxic residue, and so you're not uh, killing the natural enemies there. And then there's there's lots of you know newer chemistries that that can be used for armored scales. The important point here, uh, well, a couple important points. Many of these are neonicotinoids, which you know are you know getting more scrutiny these days from the public and, and regulators and everyone else. Uh, insect growth regulators are also 
um, a good choice for armored scales. The important thing here is that imidacloprid, one of, uh, you know, an industry favorite chemical, is not effective for armored scales. And so imidacloprid, which is merit in the landscape originally, marathon in nurseries. Now, of course, there's many, many generic formulations of that. Um, not, not effective and usually not labeled for armored scales. Okay, so that's, that's the main reason you need to be able to tell these apart is, is because of that product or that active ingredient. Okay, the other thing in terms of scale insect IPM that I wanted to touch on is, um, you know, one of the, the, the first steps in IPM is to put the right plant in the right place so that the plant is not under a great deal of stress and not susceptible because of that stress to pest insects. And so some of the work we've been doing, we've found that the amount of scale insects on a tree is very highly related to the amount of impervious surface cover around that tree. Okay? And so impervious surfaces, you know, parking lots, rooftops, sidewalks, this sort of thing, they increase the temperature of the tree. Uh, and we found that those higher temperatures increase scale, survival, and fecundity. Impervious surfaces, of course, they're impervious, so they reduce the amount of water and the soil moisture around those trees. And this can put the trees, especially with the higher temperatures, under drought stress. And we found that uh, the drought stress can also increase scale insect fecundity, so the number of eggs that they produce. So here's just a, this is the general relationship between the percent of impervious surface around a tree and the number of scales that we find on those trees. So if we know that the that scale insect abundance increases with the amount of impervious surface, can we use this to improve scale insect IPM? So we know that impervious surface cover is bad for trees, but in regards to scales, how much is too much? Okay, so, so what we started working on And when I say we here, I mean myself and my former graduate student, Adam Dale, who I think anyone who is on this webinar next time will hear from Adam. He's at the University of Florida now. Um, and so he and I started working on whether there's an impervious surface threshold we could use to predict the condition of trees and scale abundance. And it turns out that there is. And so to spare you all of the, the statistics and, and, and figures, I'll just go ahead and give you the punchline that for red maples planted, and we analyzed all the red maples in the city of Raleigh to do this. Um, red maples planted in areas with zero to 32% impervious surface at 25 meters around the tree tended to be in good or excellent condition. Uh, in the middle range of impervious surface, 33 to 66%, those trees tended to be in good or fair condition. And over that, over 66%, the trees were almost universally in poor condition. And so we kind of have a threshold now that we can use when planting trees. You know, we can make decisions about whether a red maple should go in a particular site or not. And you can also assess if you, 
if you're called upon to work on a tree uh, for a client or something, you can assess the susceptibility of an existing tree to scale insects. And so the trick, of course, with something like this is how you measure impervious surfaces. And, you know, if this is, a, well, it is, this is an existing tree that we've worked on. You could think of it as a potential planting site that you were trying to evaluate. Um, you know, for anyone who uses ArcGIS or similar programs, you can you can get the land surface covered data and calculate this relatively quickly. Um, and so around this tree is 66% impervious surface cover at 25 meters. But most folks don't use that. And so the folks who do, landscape uh, architects, landscape designers, municipal planners probably have access to this software and know how to use it. And so when they're designing landscapes, they could, uh, they could use these thresholds before they plop a red maple in every single spot on the map. Um, so planters can use it, but the planters probably often don't. And so Adam and I wanted to think about how we could provide a way for planters, folks on the ground, to measure impervious surface without a computer. So this was our challenge. And it turns out there is a way that you can do this. And that's what I'll go through next. And we call this the paste to plant method because you're just using your paces, the number of steps that you take, to measure impervious surface cover. And I've got a figure here to help illustrate this. Here's our same tree or planting site. And the way to, to use this method is choose your closest impervious edge, which in this case is right here, this curb just to the right of the tree in the, in the figure. And you turn 45 degrees to that edge, and you just take 25 steps in a relatively straight line as best as you can. Um, and then you count the number of steps that land on impervious surface. So in this case, all those white footsteps are on impervious surface. The black ones are on grass. Okay, turn 90 degrees and do that again. Turn 90 degrees and do that again. Of course, don't walk over people's cars. You can pretty much assume if you run into a car or a building that it's impervious. Um, and do that again. So now you've taken 25 steps four times, which is 100 steps. And if you've counted the number of steps that landed on impervious surface, you now have a percentage. And it turns out that this comes out the same as our calculation from ArcGIS, 66% using this method. So don't put a red maple in there. It will look like this. Or if you've got a red maple in there, you can expect that that tree will require more maintenance, maybe more monitoring, uh, maybe some extra water wouldn't hurt to reduce the drought stress on that tree. Uh, and so this can help you either plant trees in the right spot or uh, better manage existing trees. And don't worry if you're short or tall. We've done this with short students, tall students, every kind of student. It, it really doesn't matter. Um, it, it works. It seems to work with any landscape configuration. If you're on a corner at a T intersection, 
on a thin on a thin uh, you know right of way or something it seems to work there also and so again just 45 degrees to your closest impervious edge turn 90 degrees and do it again do it again and do it again the only trick here of course is trying to count and remember how many were on impervious surface uh, there's if you've got a phone which probably you do there's an app that it's a free, free app every time you touch your phone it counts for you and just use something like that or an old-fashioned clicker to record the steps on impervious surface some sort of counting app if if uh, you don't have enough fingers and toes okay so the thresholds again when you're thinking about red maples and gloomy scales 0 to 30 percent 32 percent is is good go ahead and put a red maple in there or assume that an existing tree will will be relatively resistant to gloomy scales mid-range you could have a glue uh, red maple in there but again it might take some extra love you might need to monitor it or manage it a little a little more give it some more water and that kind of thing and over that threshold just don't put a red maple in there okay so some of the things I just wanted to end with some of the resources that you can find at least that that we offer from my lab one of the things is we've got a Twitter account it's simply at ornapests on Twitter and all that I use this account for is sending out alerts on pest activity and so just in the last week or so I've alerted people to pine needle scale eggs Japanese maple eggs canker worms all different things that I've seen hatching um, around around my neighborhood and, and around campus and then periodically if there's a new article on a pest that's interesting we'll send that out also so you won't get a bunch of junk on here really just pest related information so of course you may not live in North Carolina but if you live in a cooler place this will give you a head start because whatever is hatching here will hatch further north in a week or two uh, so you can check that out if you like here's here's what that looks like um, our website is six letters eco IPM for ecology and IPM and if you want to learn the nitty-gritty or see the the journal articles about the work that that I've described you can find that here if you want the extension type materials uh, we've got lots of that stuff so under that extension tab you know if you're interested in our planting thresholds and and pace to plant we have that information up here uh, pest news there's an iBook on floriculture if that's your thing um, we write I write a lot for industry magazines like you know nursery management American nurserymen um, landscape management and that kind of thing you can find all of those publications online um, and then we've got some free iBooks here that were developed as part of a southern regional effort IPM for deciduous trees and IPM for shrubs in the southeast and so all that is up there and free so take advantage of that okay and that looks like all I've got for you today all right well thank you dr. Frank uh, now we'll uh, go ahead and transition over to Patrick uh, who's going to touch on uh, a little bit more around the uh, management strategies with uh, uh, armored scales? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Frank. Um, so, for those of you guys who are not familiar with Dr. Frank, he is doing some really great work down here 
in North Carolina, NC State, and uh, we've been privileged to collaborate with him a few times here in the past few years, and um, it's always been a great experience. And uh, just keep in mind, I mean, there's really only a handful of uh, university researchers really concentrating on our industry in arboriculture and uh, landscape management. And uh, Dr. Frank is, is just one of them, <clears throat> one of the few in doing great work. So we're really happy that he could um, be working with us here today as well. Uh, again, real quick, my name is Patrick Anderson, and I'm an arborologist with Rainbow Scientific. And my role is to go around the country and perform training both with our remote staff and with our clients as well as help develop some of these new protocols around um, pest and disease management. And so that's what we're gonna talk about now. We're just gonna kind of go through some of, um, some practical protocols for managing some of these armored scale insects in the landscape. And of course, if, um, if you guys are familiar with Rainbow, you know that you know, everything we do is, is grounded in science. And just as an example of um, some of the things we've done just last year, just last year alone, we did 130 research trials um, both in-house as well as partnering with a lot of these um, research institutions. Um, and we've contracted with Dr. Frank in the past too to help us with some gloomy scale research um, where we got some really fabulous results. Um, when we talk about management, you know, I always want to put things into context. You know, it's not about going out there and identifying a bug and just spraying it with something. Uh, we always, you know, I always go back to this, this um, appropriate response process and this article that was um, put out there many years ago now by Dr. John Ball. And we, what I want to always be doing is going through this process when we're out there in the landscaping of, of monitoring, diagnosing, trying to do prevention, setting action thresholds for a lot of these pests. So again, you know, when we talk about an IPM approach is what we're, what we're really striving for here. An IPM approach is not necessarily just going out there and spraying a bug because he's a bug. It's really getting down to the nitty gritty and, and figuring out what the best approach is around that. And, you know, if we take scales, for instance, you know, one calico scale, which is actually a soft scale, not an armored scale, but one calico scale is not a big deal. But when we look at something like a large population of white peach scale, now we've gotten to an action threshold where we might need to consider some kind of control using possibly an insecticide product uh, along those, um, something like that. One of the things too, so we mentioned as part of this monitoring, and monitoring is really key, especially as Dr. Frank was mentioning around these um, scale insects, because you know it's really timing our applications around these life cycles are gonna give us the best control. So one of the tools we had in this is measuring growing degree days and using phenology. And so growing degree days are really just a measure of heat accumulation throughout the year. And the way you determine your growing degree day is you take the high temperature of the day plus the low temperature of the day, you average that out, and then you select a base. And in horticulture, in arboriculture, we often use the base of 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we'll take the average of a high and low of the day, we'll subtract that from our base temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and that'll give us the growing degree days for that day. And those growing degree days accumulate throughout the year. So if we use this example here, if we had a high of 70, or excuse me, high 70 and a low of 50, we averaged that out and then we subtracted that from our base temperature, then we would have a growing degree day count of 10. And if that was the same for the next day, then we would accumulate that. And so these, these growing degree days accumulate throughout the year. And what people have found is that when you track these growing degree days, you can predict when some of these plant damaging pests are gonna be active, a la armored scales and other scale insects. And there's some really neat growing degree day cal um, calendars out there. This is one that I use very often. This was actually published to the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. And you can find this online if you simply just put, put in NJDA, uh, uh, growing degree calculator scale, you can find this. And this has a, a pretty extensive list of different scale insects that we deal with in the landscape. And then gives us an idea of what their growing degree day um, uh, temperatures would be. And this is all around that crawler stage. So Dr. Frank mentioned that crawler stage being the most vulnerable stage, especially if we're going to be doing things like folder applications of a product. So this is one great way that you can track um, pest emergence and really time your applications so that you're getting the best, um, most efficient way, most effective way of managing these pests and not just, again, throwing product out into the environment and not really reaching your end goal, which is, of course, managing a damaging pest. Um, 
this can be married also with phonology. And so phonology, to make a long story short here, is, is when certain things are occurring in nature, like the flowering of a plant or the emergence of a certain plant, this will often, we can have a, a coincidence of a pest becoming active as well. So, for instance, here, this picture here is of uh, smoke bush. You guys are familiar with smoke bush. This is a picture of smoke bush in bloom. And through, again, a lot of people out there paying attention and doing research, we have an idea that when smoke bush is in bloom, then those Japanese maple scale crawlers that we discussed earlier are going to start becoming active. So this would be a, um, a time here is when you're driving around and you notice that, again, in this case, the smoke bush is in bloom. Pull over, look to see those sites where you know you have Japanese maple scale, maybe start flipping over those tests, looking for egg, looking for those crawlers. So this isn't necessarily the time to go out and start spraying, but this is the time to really start keying in on monitoring a lot of these sites. So using growing degree days and phonology are really great ways to, uh, again, help us really tune in to when we need to be out there in our IPM programs, monitoring these trees, monitoring these shrubs, and then coming up with these protocols for treatment. And of course, you know, control is not just going out there and spraying chemicals. We want to look at this as a toolbox approach. And so Dr. Frank um, mentioned his research there, which I thought was really neat around the um, impervious surfaces. So, you know, again, with our control, a lot of this is just cultural control, planting the right tree in the right spot, doing it from the beginning, and then again, being able to predict when we might have issues. So when it comes to actually applying these products too, we want to know that we have a lot of different ways to apply products um, nowadays. In the past, it was solely based around spraying, but now we have a lot of great products that we can use as either a soil application or even a lower bark spray application, which we'll cover very briefly, as well as we have some tree injection options as well. And again, what we want to do is we want to realize that we have several products to help us control armor scale, and we have several different ways to apply them so that we're not always going out and doing the same thing for every pest and every site. We can really fine tune our approach to the pest, the tree, and the site. Uh, and again, be really easy on our environment while being very effective on the pests that we're actually going after. So if we start with some of our spray treatment protocols, as you see here, here's a list of products that would work very well on scale crawlers. Uh, horticultural oil. Uh, this here, this uh, pyriprofacin, um, is that insect growth regulator that was mentioned earlier. And I'm a real advocate of using the insect growth regulators when we're using a spray approach to treating scales uh, because they are soft on beneficials and they can be very, very effective at breaking up that life cycle and treating the pest. We also have some other things like Dontetran, uh, which is, of course, Transtech. Um, we have uh, acetamiprid or acetaminid, depending upon how you want to pronounce that. Uh, which is a newer neonicotinoid. And then finally, we have acephate, the old standard orthene, and then our uh, pyrethroids like permethrin and bifenthrin. Um, the, the pyrethroids I usually recommend staying away from as part of a scale management program, as there has been some studies that show that you can actually increase the abundance of scales because with these, these broad spectrum sprays like your acephates and your pyrethroids is not only are you killing the pests, but you're going to be killing any of the beneficial insects, the predators and the parasitoids along with that. And so you can see an increase in populations of your pest because you've eliminated your predators. So that's where, if we're doing a spray approach, I like the horticultural oils. I like the, uh, again, the insect growth regulators. And as mentioned before, these, the spray approach is only going to be effective on that crawler phase. So these little guys here, when we see these little guys out here, this is what we're spraying. And so if we kind of look at some of these phenological indicators and growing degree day models based around what we discussed here earlier, for gloomy scale, one of the neat phenological indicators is eight weeks after full leaf expansion of red maple is when we expect to see the crawlers of gloomy scale. And that coincides with between 1,500 and 2,500 growing degree days. As Dr. Frank mentioned, obscure scale and gloomy scale are, are pretty closely related. So this would be about the same. And, and again, as was also mentioned, um, this this timing throughout the country can be can be pretty different. Um, you know, last year we had growing degree days of around 1,500 in Charlotte, North Carolina, in around the end of May. 
Um, whereas, you know, we may not have hit this uh, in other parts of the country, maybe Pennsylvania north or so until about June or even maybe July in some years. So keying in that growing degree day, not just going to the straight, you know, well, we expect them to crawl in June, so we're going to start spraying in June type model um, is really going to help in your operations and really going to help you get in control making our clients really happy with us. Um, if we look at pine needle scale, pine needle scale can have two generations in the southern parts of the United States. Uh, these can be uh, coincide with spirea blooms for the first generation, uh, Queen Anne's lace uh, in that second generation, and again our growing degree days. And then finally our Japanese maple scales, uh, they can coincide with oak leaf hydrangea bloom, that first generation, uh, and that growing degree day of about 500 to 1600. And then finally another generation here at 2000 at 3. 2,000 to 3,000 growing degree days. Um, the important thing to note on especially, you know, our gloomy scales, obscure scales, and our Japanese red maple scales, uh, or Japanese maple scales rather, is that crawler phase can be very, very long. It, it's not like they, in many of these, it's not like they all come out on the same day. They can last for a few weeks, as Dr. Frank had mentioned. So if you're taking that spray approach, you may need to apply um, maybe twice within a uh, time frame to get control if the population is really, really heavy. So that's something to keep in mind with spray treatments is you may need to treat more than once, especially if you have multiple generations and especially have multiple overlapping generations. Uh, foliar treatments might need to be applied more than just once to get really good control. If we look at, a, this is a, a trial that we did here at Rainbow, and this is again on gloomy scale, and what this is representing is that insect growth regulator versus the untreated control here, and this is number of live scales. So you can see we had a significant reduction in the amount of live scales with two treatments of distance insect growth regulator as compared to the untreated trees, and this is on red maple here in North Carolina. Um, pretty neat stuff there. Um, now, from a soil application standpoint, as we mentioned, imidacloprid or Zytec is not going to be the product of choice for armored scales. Uh, imidacloprid is not a good product on armored scales. We do not see a lot of control in many instances with armored scales, so we do not recommend imidacloprid for armored scales. And I can't say that enough because I can't tell you how many people call me with questions on, you know, why they're not getting control, and lo and behold, they've been using Zytec on something like a euonymus scale. Um, so I will repeat that again. Imidacloprid is not going to be effective on armored scales, very effective on soft scales, not effective on armored scales. But that leads us with two other products we can use as a soil applied, which would be, again, Dinotefteran or Transtech, as well as um, Acephate, which is Lepitec, soil applied Acephate, Lepitec. Uh, and remember, Lepitex is the only soil applied option um, of acetate on the market. But again, with these, we want to be really keyed in on timing to make sure we're maximizing our dose in the tree. Um, so with our dinotetrin applications, we want to be just before or during crawling emergence. That's where in our trials we've seen the best results. And likewise with um, acetate or Lepitec, Lepitec has about a 30-day efficacy within the plant. So we want to make sure we're pretty dead on with our Lepitec applications if we're using those for armored scale. Um, of course, Dinotefteran will give us longer control, so Transtech would definitely be our number one choice for, for armored scales, but know that Lepitec is, is in your toolbox as well. And then the other thing we have here, which is really neat, is this lower bark spray option with the Dinotefteran or the Transtech. <clears throat> And so the advantages of this, of course, is, you know, the labor savings is, is phenomenal because it's very quick to go. All you're doing here is you're, you're applying one and a half to two ounces per inch diameter from about four or five feet down onto the root flare, and you're getting the full circumference spray to wet. So it goes really fast. There's little to no drift. Um, it's really simple to do. You don't need a lot of equipment to do it. You can do it with a simple backpack sprayer. And again, if you're applying it correctly, just if you're spraying to wet and you're applying that one and a half to two ounces per inch diameter, if you compare that to soil application, soil drenches, the same rate, um, you actually can have a overall cost savings on, in material of 40%. So I advocate for this a lot. If we look at some data, again, this is stuff that um, Dr. Frank, we contracted Dr. Frank to help us out with this trial. Um, this is comparing some of our uh, transtake treatments. So we can see here, this is our untreated control. And then if we compare that to transtech soil injected with our HTI and transtech basal bark spray, again, at that protocol I just mentioned at one and a half to two ounces per inch um, diameter. 
spraying from about five feet down to wet on the trunk, we got really great results. Um, so here's another great option for you using TransTech. Uh, if we look at pine needle scale, another one that we talked about today, we have, uh, in this case here, we have our control. This is the percent mortality of second instar nymphs. Our control, we had 8.5% mortality, whereas with our TransTech treatments, this was um, over 90% mortality. Uh, likewise, if we look at our um, number of adult females that are still alive, um, quite a few alive on our control. Um, almost none here on our TransTech treated. So another great um, product there, another great opportunity to use that. Finally here, if we look at Lepitect, and so this is our trial here that we did. This was in uh, cooperation with Morton Arboretum quite a few years back. And so what we're looking at here, these were you know, your standard kind of smaller euonymus um, shrubs using two different applications of Lepitect, we got pretty phenomenal results uh, here. So this is another option for you. Again, the TransTech will last a little bit longer. Dinotephrine will last longer in the plant, will give you longer pieces of control. But Lepitect, again, is an option, especially if you have one of these clients that are, you know, really keyed into the news and are, are kind of spooked by the neonicotinoids. This is an, an alternative for the neonicotinoid. And we also do have not only a soil injection for this, but we also have a uh, formulation that can be stem injected. Uh, again, not too many reasons why you'd want to stem inject and, and euonymus, but for some of the other scales, it might be uh, an option for us. So to wrap up with our treatment protocols, again, diagnosis is going to be key to armored scale management. Uh, we have many foliar applied products that are effectively managed armored scales, but we have to make sure our timing is going to be correct based upon the, the species of the scale and, of course, um, you know, how long that crawler emergence might be. Uh, we have several systemic choices, again, with our dinotephuran and acephate. Um, but again, we want to make sure that our product choice and the timing is going to coincide with getting the maximum amount of product into the plant uh, to coincide with, you know, that crawler's feeding there. That being said, of course, thank you all for attending today. We do have some other talks coming up. We have another one coming up tomorrow about um, equipment overview, maintenance and repair. We have a soft scale presentation coming up with uh, Dr. Dale, who worked with Dr. Frank before he became a PhD and moved down to Florida uh, next week, April 13th. Um, we have some more stuff on soil nutrition and fertilization that we have not uh, scheduled yet, but is to be announced. And then finally, we've already had two other um, topics for our spring webinar series. And they're available to view at treecarescience.com. And this is being recorded today and will also be available to view at treecarescience.com. And with that, um, if you guys have any, if we have time for questions, I know we're running a little short on time, um, but I'd be happy to stay on the line. I'm sure Dr. Frank would have to stay on the line just for a few more sure. moments to answer any questions there. Uh, there's my information. You can follow me at the Wandering Arb at Twitter, where I usually just retweet Dr. Frank's tweets. So um, <laughs> with that, <laughs> any questions? All right. Well, thanks, Patrick, and uh, thanks, Dr. Frank. Uh, so if you if you do need to uh, log off, uh, certainly do that, and uh, you know we'll, we'll make sure that you get your CU. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, please enter in your ISA certification number into the questions and chat box, and uh, uh, we'll make sure that you get your CU for attending. Uh, we'll stay on the line here to answer any uh, any questions. Um, let's see. Uh, first question here uh, is from Eric. Uh, are there field ID characteristics to distinguish Japanese maple scale and oyster uh, shell scale? Uh, any host differences? Um, let's see. Well, they, they are very similar. I, if I recall, they may even be in the same genus. Um, I would have to, I've got to look, like I say, I, it's hard to remember every single kind of scale. They're very similar. I think the, you know, the main point from a management perspective is, uh, you know, they are armored scales and they're going to have even if you can't tell the difference, the management principles would be similar. The difference, of course, may may be in the life history of those. Um, so yeah, so 
I, I can't tell you. I don't. I'm not. I don't have my fabulous scale book handy. I can't tell you off the top of my head the differences between those two. Japanese maple scale seems to be far more common and generalist, though. Okay. Uh, next question here. Uh, what about Zytec for soft scales? So again, this is Patrick. Zytec for soft scales should work very well. Um, where we've seen breakdowns in efficacy of Zytec on soft scales has come around to that timing issue because Zytec and metoclopramide, of course, takes longer to get up into the tree and accumulate in parts of the plant to um, levels where it will actually um, kill the pest. So, you know, if you're trying to manage a scale that begins crawling in um, the end of May and you apply Zytec the second week of May, it's going to be a while before you see results. So timing is crucial with Zytec, but you should have um, really good results with soft scale in Zytec. Okay, next question here. Uh, is acetate foliar effective on adults? So I would say um, no, not not that well. You know, of course, as adults are feeding and the um, acetate is translaminar, so it will make it uh, through the leaves. Um, but it's been my experience um, that you're going to get your your best bang for your buck by targeting those um, crawlers. And I don't know, Dr. Frank, if you have any other additional comments to clarify that any better or not. Yeah, I think that's I, I think that's a fair assessment, and especially since um, you know the acetate is is translaminar, and and uh, but for bark feeding scales, that's not going to get you very far. For you know leaf feeding armored scales, like maybe euonymus scale um, and things like that, where you would benefit more from that translaminar activity. Um, so, you know, and again, some of these scales, they've got such overlapping life cycles that after that first spring generation where you might have a fairly synchronous hatching uh, many times of the year for Japanese maple scales and these others, you have many life stages all at the same time. And so, so that's where it gets tricky. But yeah, I think, you know, especially for leaf feeding, scales, you would get more benefit probably from the translaminar aspect of that product. Okay, and then uh, another qu a question here from John. Uh, if a maple tree has a very heavy gloomy scale population on the trunk, will the tree be able to absorb transtech? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so with our trials, um, they did have some pretty good um, infestations of gloomy scale on the trunk, um, and it was able to, um, you saw we did get some efficacy there. Um, to be honest, I mean, to be honest with you, if it's really super caked on there, I, I don't know. Um, again, usually, you know, many of those, and, and Dr. Frank can correct me if I'm wrong or elaborate, you know, a lot of those scales that you're seeing on there often, you know, old, dead, female scales. So, um, you know, I'm not sure what the integrity of that, that test is once they've died and, you know, certainly um, break down with some weather and the product will be able to make it through. Um, but that's a great question. We maybe need to try to quantify that a bit better. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that uh, quite that way. But, um, but Patrick's right. Many of those scales are dead. Um, and, and in some cases, all of them are. It seems like, uh, you know, on some trees, as that trunk bark gets thicker, my hypothesis is that, you know, as the trunk bark gets thicker, the scales just can't reach the cells that they need to. So sometimes it looks like the trunk is, is very heavily infested. Um, but if you flip over some of those scales, there may not be anything under there, even if the branches are still heavily infested. But yeah, whether, you know, how much that would repel a trunk application um, or whether it would make any difference, I, I, I have no idea. All right. Uh, another uh, additional question here from John. Uh, could a person brush off some of the gloomy scale on the trunk? 
So, uh, you know, that's something that we need to look at. I mean, people have, I mean, I think that you could potentially, and, and folks I think have tried this with like crepe myrtle bark scale, you know, get out a power washer and, and as long as you've got pressure that's not gonna actually peel the bark from the tree, you may be able to actually clean up some of that infestation uh, just, yeah, by essentially scrubbing them off. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that, it would it would be it would be nice to know, and we and we've thought about that. Um, and and even after even if you were lucky enough to get rid of all the live scales with an insecticide, those tests stay on there for a long time and give the tree that gloomy appearance. And so maybe that's another way in which. Uh, you could spruce up a tree for a client with the power wash in the winter time, probably. Um, even you know, just to get rid of all those scales, it deserves some work. All right. Well, that looks like the, uh, that's it for questions. Uh, just want to wrap up uh, here by uh, again thanking Dr. Frank and Patrick uh, for their presentations today. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this webinar. Uh, and uh, there is a post survey that follows this webinar once you log off, and um, it's completely anonymous and voluntary. So if uh, you take the time to fill that out, uh, that would be much appreciated. We're always looking at ways to improve what we do here uh, at Rainbow. So thank you all again, and uh, have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a great one.